Hi, I'm Ron. And I'm Don. And this is the Ron and Don Show. Thanks for joining us today. We're very pleased to have our sponsor, Pavement Exchange, send Tom O'Toole to us so Tom can explain to us uh, pavement failures, diagnosis, and repair. Yes, I'll do my best. Tell us a little bit about Pavement Exchange. Well, uh, Pavement Exchange was started by Henry and Mary Miller, uh, believe it or not, out of a minivan, uh, filling potholes with coal patch. Um, kind of over the years, uh, one thing led to another, expanded the services, and um, we cover the United States. We've actually done some work in Puerto Rico and in Canada, across state lines, or country, country, country lines. Um, we, uh, we primarily work parking lot maintenance, not much new construction at all, but we, we can facilitate that for our customers. Very nice. Well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you guys. When we talk about pavement problems, you know, pavement failures, particularly for asphalt, but even for concrete and, and problems, what are the common causes for pavement failures? Well, there's a few factors, but what we're finding in our experience is a pavement exchange is it's an inadequate design to handle the load. So um, a, a lot of times when uh, these, these sites have been built back in the 70s. They weren't designed to handle the volume of traffic that they're experiencing. We get asked a lot, how long is my parking lot going to last? And that's kind of like a loaded question. Mm -hmm. If I build a parking lot and I never drive on it, it's going to last forever. Mm -hmm. But as I start driving on it, 18 wheelers start coming in, delivery trucks, dump trucks, work. It doesn't last quite as long as people would like. Do you mean when somebody drives over it with a big heavy truck, the pavement actually flexes a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, asphalt does flex. Um, it, it expands and contracts. So um, y if you have the right pavement design um, and, and everything starts with the structural integrity of the asphalt and the subgrade, if you have the proper design, you'll get much longer, uh, much longer life on your asphalt. By design, you're talking about the subsoil, the, the base material, the gravel. What all goes into all that? So sure. So you have your subgrade, which is the, the natural dirt, Mother Earth, right? You have a stone, um, imported fill, compacted stone. You have your binder asphalt, which is the asphalt underneath the asphalt that you drive on, which is your surface course asphalt. And do different subsoils require special treatment before even the, the, uh, the base goes down? Absolutely. Um, geographically speaking, it's different in Massachusetts than it is out in Arizona. Sometimes there's um, uh, hydrostatic pressure or, or, or water in the, in the soil that you have to address. So you can do cement stabilization, but regardless of where you're at in the country, you, you know, the, the, if you build a building on a weak foundation, it's not going to last very long. So it's very important to have that structural integrity uh, before you start paving the, the parking lot. So when moisture gets down into the base and the subsoil, what happens? Well, a lot of things happen actually, uh, Don. It's, um, if the water, if you don't remove that water via trench drain or there's not enough fall or pitch in, in the dirt to get that water from collecting in a specific area, um, it will just sit there and as the load goes over top, the weight goes over top of your, your surface, whether it's concrete or asphalt, it'll, uh, it, it, it'll decrease the lifespan uh, of that surface. And what if we have some areas when they were paving with asphalt where they have a cold joint or with concrete where they didn't do good seals between the, the pores where they formed it off? Sure. Um, we get water in there? Absolutely. So it is really essential really essential that anytime you're working with concrete or asphalt and you have cold seam joints and asphalt tack is very very important they should be tacking the vertical edge of the adjacent asphalt prior to installing the asphalt concrete they should be dialing in to the ad adjacent concrete and then after the um the concrete the new concrete is poured they should be caulking or joint sealant that's that joint and seam water is your is your biggest um, deterrent, uh, excuse me, is your biggest um, reason for, for failure. You, you started out talking about proper design uh, or improper design, if you will, leads to failure. Well, I think in, in the scenario, in the world we all live in, uh, we've got facility managers that are responsible for buildings that they're not involved in the design process. So, so it is what it is in the proverbial sense. They've got what they've got and they need to deal with it. So that being the case, 
How do they analyze failures in asphalt surfaces? Well, uh, there's something called a pavement condition index, which can give you a numerical value. Pavement condition index. Yes. Okay. It was Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. It was designed by the Army Corps of Engineers back in the 70s. It'll give you a numerical value for your parking lot. Okay. Um, zero being the worst case scenario, 100 being the best case scenario. Well, it, it, in the collective it, 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 gathering that data, there's a lot of asphalt distresses. So one of the most common ones is alligator cracking block cracking, joint failure, which, and to analyze that, if you have alligator cracking, uh, a lot of failure starts when traffic drives over the asphalt, a lot of failure starts from the, the base binder asphalt and comes to the surface. So what you're seeing is also happening below. So it'll reflect, the, the binder asphalt will reflect of the well, that's, failure. That's actually called, isn't it, reflective cracking? Something that started way down below yes. and the cracks slowly work their way to the surface. Absolutely, and, and that's why it's real critical, um, and, and I'm sure we'll touch on this uh, shortly, but with overlays, if you overlay bad asphalt, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have much longevity. So, so let, me, let me stop though, just to clarify or go a little deeper on part of that. So you're talking about a surface inspection which doesn't necessarily stop at the surface, so the deficiency can be below the surface and propagate up to the surface. The other thing I heard you say is drainage. Drainage is a huge issue in terms of why we have failures like we do. Yes, sir. Okay, good. And, and are there any other inspection techniques that you use besides just the visual? Well, we can do core samples. Okay. Um, we can find out the thickness of the asphalt. You know, it, it happens a lot in shopping centers and in our truck and terminals. When these were designed back in the late 60s, 70s, and when some of these properties were built, they weren't designed to handle the volume of traffic that they're handling, experiencing now. Um, they weren't, the, the, so they're only, we're finding in Florida, uh, you have great um, lime rock down here as a base or subgrade, uh, and it's very strong. But in some other geographic areas, it's, it's not as strong. And when you only have two inches of asphalt, you need something structural, the structural integrity. There's no compacted stone, as you referenced earlier. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests at Pavement Exchange to, uh, hey, I have a pothole, so to speak. Well, you don't just want to cut at the edge of the pothole. You want to go about two feet outside of that because the binder asphalt underneath it is also failing the part you don't see. So you'll have, if you don't go far enough, you'll have encroachment from the poor asphalt coming back into the new patch, which then you'll start having warranty issues and you'll start getting phone calls, which you really want to uh, mitigate. When you have, um you see the parking lot's got cracks and problems in it. Talk to me about crack sealing. What, when, what, what is the proper method for crack sealing? This is where pavement maintenance starts. Not everybody has open checkbooks and not everybody, most everybody is reactive versus proactive. However, one of the best resources you can use um, to help sustain the life of your parking lot is to crack fill. Now crack fill, you have longitudinal, cracks in the as asphalt, transverse cracks in the asphalt, and that's just the random cracks that you'll see. Um, and then you have joint cracks where uh, the paver passed and the next pass he made where that came together, you'll have a joint reflective cracking. So um, it's very important to clean those cracks out prior to crack filling. So you can either use a router and, and pass the router over the crack to get the debris out or use an air lance which blows the, the dirt, debris, leaves, et cetera, out, so that when the crack sealing goes on, it actually seals, seals the crack, it actually goes down into the crack a little bit. What kind of weather conditions should you have for that? Well, that's real important as well. Ideally, so asphalt expands and contracts, as I mentioned just a little bit earlier. Ideally, you don't want to do it in either extreme heat, because that's when the, the asphalt is, is the smallest, or extreme cold, where the, the, the crack is opened at its widest point. Crack fill is designed to move with the asphalt, so you want to do it in fair temperatures. Well, the old Yankees I used to talk to used to say, love those 50 degree days up north for crack sealing because they're used to it going down to 20 below. So, you know. Yeah, that's, uh, again, ge the, geographic, the geographic conditions will determine a lot. They only get four or five months a year up there to get some of this stuff done, so it may be a good decision to get some deterrent, get to keep that water out 
for the little bit of time that you can. I mean, and not in the most ideal condition, but I still re highly recommend it. Um, I guess the fi final time is, do you squeegee that in or do you just pour it in? Well, you pour it in and there's a little, it's a little V tool that they pass over top. If you just let it, if you just pour it on and, and you don't pass that tool over top of it, tires as they drive over can peel it back up and then it's just, it just gets messy. It can actually almost, if it's not installed correctly, um, it'd be a trip hazard. It, you know, it, it's raised up off the asphalt. So if you can squeegee it and it, you know, if you have your asphalt surface and it goes down inside the crack, um, it, it, it'll move and expand with that asphalt and, and it, it'll prolong the life of your asphalt. So the squeegee actually helps it get into the crack a yes, little, little deeper yes. and then top coats it in effect so that it's safe. That's okay. Right. So just so I'm clear, uh, the Crack sealing process is a precursor to both seal coating and to overlay. Definitely. Yeah, um, for sure for seal coating. Overlays, um, again, you want to, you wouldn't overlay any kind of distressed asphalt, okay. ideally. Right. Um, it, it's going to, you know, you see a lot of people overlay asphalt over concrete. Well, concrete has joints. Well, you're never going to stop that at some point it's going to it's going to reflect through at some point but um, ideally you, you definitely want to treat all your asphalt distresses prior to any overlay can you tell us the proper way to do a pothole yes when in doubt rip it out as we like to it's a little joke we have uh, amongst us at pavement exchange so ideally you you want to cut saw cut outside the distressed area make sure you en encompass the um, distressed asphalt at the binder the, the part you don't see, full depth, go all the way down to the subgrade. Prior to doing anything, after you take that asphalt out and you remove it, you need to compact that subgrade. Well, what, what, you've, you're taking out the wear surface, yes, sir. the base uh, material, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the, the asphalt that sort of doesn't have as many fines in right. it, and then you're taking out the gravel base underneath it, you're going all the way down to original dirt. That's right. And, and so there's three primary functions. If you were to reinvent the Taj Mahal. There's three factors, how structurally sound something is, the aesthetics, how it looks, and water drainage. That's your three primary things that we're gonna concentrate on when we're gonna fix a pothole. We'll take it all the way out to the dirt and recompact that to what we refer to as a firm and unyielding base. And again, if you build a building on a weak foundation, it's not gonna last very long. It's just a matter of time. So it's that for the analogy I like to use. So. Once that's done, if it's not a, if it is a yielding base, you need to undercut it and replace it with the stone, the compacted stone, until it's a firm unyielding base, and then you can reinstall the asphalt. But it's very important prior to installing the asphalt that you tack coat those edges of those potholes uh, of the adjacent asphalt so that it'll eliminate that expansion and contraction. And that pavement exchange, we make it an internal process and it is standard. Any asphalt repair that's completed we crack seal, or Henry, as Henry would say, gutter seal the edges uh, of, the, of the pavement from where the new asphalt meets the existing asphalt. Now, I would imagine that the process, generally speaking, the process you're going through to patch a pothole is probably not a lot different than the way you treat a broken area of concrete as well. Absolutely. It's uh, the exact same. You remove the distressed area all the way down to the dirt, Compact that subgrade, same firm on yielding base. If you don't have that, undercut stone, you bring compacted stone, different ge geographic regions, call it 57 stone, crush and run, uh, depending on what it is. Um, so you remove the concrete, you dial into the adjacent, in the freeze and thaw climates, you always want to dial in, and in, in Texas it's very prevalent that we always, there's a lot of rebar and steel in that concrete down in Texas. Um, so. You dial into the adjacent concrete. Let me let me stop you there, just just for someone who might not quite understand what you're saying. Dowel in is what? Define that. It's taking um, the vertical edge of uh, where the repair is open, taking that vertical edge, taking a hammer drill, and you're drilling into the concrete sideways, and you're sticking either a piece of rebar in there, or a, a round cylindrical smooth dowel. By definition, is a dowel a smooth cylindrical. Um, and it sticks out about 12 inches outside of the old concrete. So when the new concrete's poured, it, it, it goes around that 
so if there's any heaving, it, it'll, it'll hold it in place. So that's what's meant by pinning concrete? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. And when you're, when you're doing that concrete work, particularly in Texas where you have highly expansive soil, do you occasionally have to lime stabilize that base a little bit? <sighs> yes, um, what we do what's called subgrade stabilization, which is um, a different way to, in the asphalt realm, when, when a milling machine can grind up the existing asphalt with the existing dirt or stone, grind it up, leave it in place, and can, can be an alternative cost effectively um, instead of removing the asphalt, hauling it off site. You can treat that subgrade with cement stabilization. You mix it up, you wet it a little bit, and you roll it, and then you pave over top of it. Terrific information. Tom, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And thank you to Pavement Exchange uh, for our, their sponsorship in our show today. I've used Pavement Exchange for a number of years, and they've been an excellent uh, source for me. Tom, you've been a, a, a wonderful expert witness for us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, gentlemen. Thank you, Tom. I'm Ron. I'm Don. And I'm Tom. And this is The Ron and Don Show. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe.